Welcome to another episode of Before You Kill Yourself with your host, Leo Flowers. I am Leo Flowers. I keep saying I'm going <laughs> to stop saying that, but I, I, clearly it's, it's not going to happen, guys. Uh, today's guest is Jared Bull, who's joining me. Where are you at right now, Jared? I am, I'm in Helena, Montana. Helena, Montana. That Correct. sounds like a, a, like a high altitude. <laughs> like what altitude is that? Uh, it's surprisingly where I live is only a few thousand feet up. So I think 5,000 feet or so it's not that high. Cause we're in a Valley. Okay. All right. And, and mm-hmm. so are you, are you breathing well up there? Is there any altitude issues or anything like that or not? Nah? Well, there's definitely seasonal affective disorder because there's literally probably seven hours of sunlight in the winter. And it's, I mean, it's dark out now so it's just like five o'clock four p.m hits it's dark it's like okay bedtime <laughs> so there's that and of course lots of, we can get eight months of snow here sometimes it's very very extreme weather eight months of snow limited yeah. daylight and <laughs> um you know i'm excited to have you on because we want to discuss your your book good oliver dooley and the Pal- palace of keepers uh book one so that tells me there's going to be a book two yeah um but it's based off of your your struggle with suicidal ideations from the age of 10, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Um, well, firstly, thank you for having me on your show. This is so fun and cool for me. Um, so grateful. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, so I, it was probably, um, life happens and sometimes it doesn't happen the way we want, of course. And Back in 2015, my life took a turn very sharply to the left and unexpectedly to a dark place that I just didn't see coming. It was like it was like the universe pulled a rug out from underneath my feet, and I had to just start over. Everything I had, I lost everything: financial, uh, friends, home, everything. And so I came back to Montana because I wasn't I wasn't living here. I was in Los Angeles, and I, you know, I was in my early thirties. I was like, what happened to my life? This was, this was not the plan. <laughs> this was not what was, I, I was in Los Angeles modeling and acting and, and, you know, I'm basically homeless living in Montana. So I come back here to live with my family and I'm going to, I decided to go back to college and then I get, um, I have to be busy. That's one of the things I know about myself in order to keep myself sane is that I have to be busy doing creative things, productive things. And um, I was going to college and I was bored actually. I was like, this is, this is so easy and, and I don't have to even think through this process. And so I was like, I'm, I'm going to write a book. And this, this girlfriend of mine, we were having ice cream one day and I said, I'm going to write a book, I think. And she's like, oh, what's it about? And I said, I don't have no, I have no idea actually. I just know I'm going to write a book. And so uh, I sat down and started writing some ideas. And what I essentially started was with, I wanted to create a world that I wanted to be in. That was the first, the first thing that I wanted to create. And so I just let my mind roam and play and, and, and be free with what that looked like. And I love gardening and I love plants and flowers and bees. And, and so that's where I started with the, with the kind of background of the, the, you know, the, the setting. And then I was like, okay, I want to make this something that can help people. Um, I want to make this more than just a fun story. I want it to be more than just about the magic and and the adventure. I want it to be something critical because that's what life has become or did become for me. It was critically different. It was painful. And um, my suicidal ideation had gone away for many years, but came back when that big change happened in my life. And as you mentioned, as... um, you know, it started when I was 10 years old and I was, um, overweight and made fun of and, uh, I'm gay. So that was another added thing to it. And, um, I just remember as a kid that there was this voice that started to say in, in my head, it would repeat the tapes of the things that people said to me, you know, it would repeat those things. And, for me in my experience in mental health is that I started to believe those things. 
I started to believe the tapes that were playing in my head. And then from there, the idea comes like, oh, well, there's a way out. And so it's like this voice first convinces me that I'm bad or I'm stupid or I'm ugly or I'm, um, I'm just not right for this world. I'm gay, so I don't belong. Whatever, whatever the reason. And then, so once that voice starts that tape and I believe it, then it's like, but there's a way out of this. And that's why for me, it's so cunning and evil and baffling because there's layers to that voice. And um, what I did was decided for this book, I wanted to have the main character, obviously the book is based primarily on my own experiences in life. I wanted to have the main character experience what that voice was like. And so I developed this villain. Um, the villain's name is Odalum. And that name I derived from a tree in India called the Odalum tree that is synonymous with suicide because people take it and ingest it to commit suicide. And so I gave the name, the villain, the name Odalum because what he does is he has this power to infest someone's mind and to convince them to kill themselves. So that's kind of where the story, the seed for that, that idea came from. Um, so, so take me back because there's so much I want to unpack here. First of all, thank you for, for sharing your journey. How old are you now? <laughs> I just turned 37. I had to think for a minute. <laughs> 37. And, and I, and mm -hmm. I want to, um, you know, I want to highlight that first of all, because, you know, as I've shared with my listeners, I've struggled with suicide ideation since the age of nine. And mm -hmm. it's, 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 it stemmed from a feeling of being a burden to my mom financially mm. i just thought that if i wasn't around then she'd have more money to party and hang out and travel and then i realized i just wanted to party hang out and travel it was is me projecting mm. um but it was just this over this over sensitivity and over empathizing with what other people might be going through without even having confirming it or validating it or mm. checking in with them um mm. and, and finding out and, and uh, being curious enough but so at the at the age of 10, you're 37 now. What at the age of 10 kept you going? If you're having those thoughts at the age of 10, like was there therapy? Were there friends? Did you have siblings? Like what was giving you the strength to keep going at the age of 10 and not um, just acting on it? Yeah. Well, you know, I... I made soft attempts. Like I would make soft attempts. I don't want to, I don't know how graphic I should get, but um, mostly it was um, like self-inflicted harm. Like, you know, trying to cut myself or something is, is where I would, I would get to the kind of my boundary or my limit. And then I would stop because it was so, it was upsetting. It was upsetting to witness or to experience. So in those, in those moments, I would stop because it was so painful to be feeling that way too. So it was a very weird combination of wanting to escape, but at the same time, it was so, it was so painful to do that too. Um, and I can, I can't really say for sure if there was one specific thing. I, I think that because those ideas came and went over the years, um, and I know that there was probably several factors that kept me going kept me kept me from actually following through all the way and one of those things was uh service um and i found a great reprieve in life when i started doing community theater when i was in high school i found it a you know a release a way to express but i also found camaraderie um peers um because I grew up in a severely alcoholic and drug abusing environment home. Um, the, when I was really little, it was not like that, but as the disease of, you know, obsession, alcoholism, drugs progresses, it gets worse over time. And it did in my home. And I moved out when I was 15 and because I couldn't, I couldn't live in the environment anymore because it was so 
it was so bad. And when I moved out, things got better for a little bit. And then I got a little more hope because I was like, well, my life isn't as chaotic. I'm not as responsible for, you know, kind of what you said, you, you were being held responsible. You felt accountable. You felt responsible for uh, the financial burden. Well, um, I definitely shared some of that experience with my, with my upbringing. Um, I, it was tumultuous. I, I just remember thinking to myself, I just want to go to school. And I just want to do normal things. I don't want to have to think about where my food is coming from or if my mom is going to be home or, you know, she'd be gone for three or four days. We didn't know where she was at. And all I remember is at the age of 15, when I moved out, I just remember there was this voice inside of me that said, if you don't leave, she's going to die. Because I found out that my siblings and I, our presence in her life was enabling her because my father had left and he was sending her money and in form like child support to pay for our necessities, which she wasn't, she wasn't using that money for that purpose. She was using it for drugs and alcohol. So I've, I realized like if I was gone, she wouldn't have that financial backing essentially. So, and, and so I don't know what that is. I would I, personally, I refer to it as divine intervention or a higher power. It was very much, because there was no person in my life that told me that. Like, no one in my life said, leave. They said, stay. They said, take care of her. <laughs> and so uh, so I left. And then when I left, things got better. Um, cause I, I went to stay with an aunt. And I was able to join the theater. Like I said, I found a way to be of service. I got myself out of the situation that was that was really, really scary. And things got better for a while. Um but then things got dark again too over the years and those ideas kind of would come back and, and go away. Suicidal ideation would come back and go away. Um, but I found that my happiest times of reprieve, and this kind of takes me into the other aspect of the story for um, good Oliver Dooley is this element of service of being a part of something bigger than yourself. That when I'm in that space, there's no, um, there's no self-abuse happening in my head. There's no voice convince me I'm stupid or fat or ugly or don't belong. There's there's no voice trying to convince me to find a way out. And so when I notice that pattern, I'm like, I need, not that I want, but I need to be connected to something greater than myself in the sense of service and purpose. And I know others have spoken about that um, sense of purpose being important for people, especially those um, with um, suicidal ideation. I've heard of that before. and But until I felt it, I, I didn't really connect that to something. And so in the story, um, good Oliver Dooley, when he become, his mind becomes essentially possessed by this villain who's trying to convince him to kill himself, he realizes, like, no, I'm a part of this beautiful world now. And I'm important here. And if, and in fact, he's so important that if he dies, the entire kingdom falls with him. And so he's like, no, I can't. I can't do this. I have to stay here and fight for this place and contribute and serve. And he loves it, you know, and it gives him a purpose. It gives him a place. And he has friends, of course. And and so in that realization, he not only identifies the voice, like this voice is not my friend. This voice is not doing what's in my best interest. And then he's like, but if I die, this entire place dies with me. And, that, and for me, that's so metaphorical. It's like, if I die, all the people that do love me, part of them would, I feel like they die too. A part of them goes. When someone d kills themselves, I feel like those who love that person, a part of them goes with them. It goes with that person. Well, that's a very powerful way to to phrase that. Um, and and I definitely want to peel back the layers more on this book, um, The Good Oliver Dooley, which has five stars on Amazon, ladies and gentlemen. So please get it while you can. Good Oliver Dooley in the Palace of Keepers, book one. And it's powerful that you wrote this because research shows that um, 
reading about how someone um, has been on a precipice of wanting to end their life, and then they find the strength, courage, and hope to continue living and, and, and moving forward and are empowered to do so, it gives other people who are reading it that same strength, courage, and hope and empowerment um, as does reading about someone who's ended their life, then that, you know, we see an uptick in suicides with that also. So uh, I appreciate you finding the courage, strength, and hope to write this book and share this story and, and for it to come from such a personal place. Um, what's your relationship with your mom now? Uh, that's a very good question. And it's amazing. It's amazing. She... So that, that was a long journey for both of us, she and I. Um, it was so difficult because my mom was actually the one that was I was closest to when I was a kid. My father was um, very much not emotionally available. And um, to have her to have her have, you know, alcoholism and substance abuse manifest in her and then progressively get worse. Um, and then for me to have to leave her was in, in my memory, of course, it's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Um, and I, all I can attribute that is something greater than myself was guiding me through that very day. Every, and I remember it like it was yesterday because it's so vividly seared into my mind. Um, you know, she was passed out on the couch and, and I was like, I, I just have to leave here. I, and, and if I tried to talk to her about it, of course, there's no reasoning. Um, and so I just had to go. And so I tried to go and, you know, she woke up and tried to stop me. And it was, it was so scary and sad and heartbreaking because, because, because deep down, of course, I didn't want to leave. And deep down, she didn't want me to leave. Of course, she would never want me to leave, but she wasn't in control. It was her disease. Her addiction was in control. And it was, it was so difficult to put words to even how, to how difficult it was to leave. It's so difficult when you're an adult, but as a kid, I'm thinking of it almost as if it wasn't something that, that didn't happen, as if it didn't happen to me because it seems so impossible. And that's how I know something bigger than myself was guiding me. Um, at least that's what it felt like. Because with my own human strength, I don't think I could have done it alone. And like I said, no one was there. It was just she and I. There was no other person there, you know, pulling me out by my arm or anything. So um, I just remember thinking she's gone. I remember when I left, I drove away. I just remember thinking, I'm never going to see her again. And that I didn't know, but that's how it felt. And that could have been a cognitive dissonance thing where in order for me to, to actually get out of there, I probably had to tell myself that um, so that I could detach from the situation and actually leave. Because if I, if I didn't probably believe that, I probably wouldn't have left. Um, and so I didn't see her for a couple years. Um, I I was still living in that town and you know I was enjoying certain aspects of my life as as I said a lot of things were enjoyable then I started doing theater and stuff you know and I was still going to school and I was working a part-time job and and um uh, so I, it was a, f a while before I saw her or at least spoke to her and then she um she got remarried and that relationship was another toxic one that didn't go very well. And I think she married, she stayed married to that, to that man for 10 years. And I had moved away to LA and San Francisco. I lived in California at that time. So it had probably been like 10 years before I had a real conversation with her. And then I started to talk to her once in a while, just on the phone. And, um, and it sounded like she was, she was like, she was getting a divorce from this other person who was also a, an addict. And she was just sounds like she was done. She just kind of, she just got done doing everything. She kind of hit her bottom, I guess. Um, and um, she hasn't used since then. And since, and since that time when she made that decision, you know, I slowly started to rebuild my relationship with her. 
Um, and then it was very interesting because I was still very much at arm's length with her because I was too scared. I was too scared to really establish a loving, trustworthy relationship with her after everything that had happened. Um, and so when this life event in my life happened where I lost everything and I moved back to Montana, I actually lived with her. I lived with her for two years. So I was in my early 30s living with her. And I hadn't lived with her since I was 15. And I can only attribute that again to another, to a higher power or something greater than myself, because I would never have signed up for that willfully. It was the only option I really had. And what I realized what was happening was I've been given a, I've been given a chance to amend, to mend that relationship because she's still alive. She's changed. She's turned her own life around. And it was just the most beautiful and perfect opportunity for me to reconnect and reestablish a mother-son relationship that, as I mentioned, when I was 15, I had basically said, I had kind of written it off. I was like, okay, this is done. She's, she's officially out of my life. And so I'm lucky because I know a lot of people don't get that opportunity. And a lot of people witness their loved ones succumb to addiction and never come out of it. And I'm really grateful, not only because she has um, turned things around for herself, but that the relationship is bold and beautiful and healthy. Like I know how to love her now. I know how to love her and respect her. And she does with me and, you know, she is riddled with guilt, bless her heart. You know, she has so much guilt, which, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about, like, you know, you're making an amends too. You, you, you're living amends and you get to do everything differently now and you have all this opportunity. And, you know, so it's been profound to be able to experience that. So it's, it's to answer your question <laughs> in a long way. Uh, it's really good. Beautiful and good. It's powerful because a lot of times when we're in the midst of it, in the darkness, we feel like nothing's going to change. Everything is permanent. And I want to mm -hmm. highlight something that you said because there are people email me and the listeners know that they can email me at leoflowers2000 at gmail. And sometimes people email me talking about or sharing how that they've lost everything. And I want to highlight the idea that that's a feeling. It's a belief. It's not a fact, right? Because mm -hmm. the, the fact that you can share that you've lost everything means that you haven't lost everything, right? It, you're, you're still alive, <laughs> so there's still an opportunity. Mm -hmm. You haven't lost your life. Uh, the, the, it, it could feel like you lost everything, as you shared, Jared, mm -hmm. where your job, your finances, relationships, it feels like we've lost everything. And, and so we lose sight of the things that we still have, the things that we still value as you, as you shared even earlier, talking about the, the people that you care about, the people who love and, and have supported you, uh, I'm sure your aunts included and, and uh, the people that you are involved in theater and, and that you, uh, have collaborated with for, uh, in terms of being of service, those people, uh, would miss you and they would care about you and, uh, they would lose a part of themselves if, if you ended your life. So I, I just want to highlight that because if there are listeners out there who are feeling like that, like I'm, I'm losing everything, I've lost everything, I, I, I want you to sit down with that thought and, and really peel back specifically what you've lost, but then also take an inventory of, of the resources and tools and skills and people that you you still have and the purpose that you still have and and start from there um but i i just want to acknowledge and and highlight that so when you said earlier that you lost everything talk us through that like you you go from montana you end up in la you're modeling you're acting and then w when the bottom falls out what does that look like specifically um yeah that's a good question because it just it happened so quickly too so, yeah, uh, you know, I've been modeling since um, I was probably 19 or so. And I mean, it was before 
Instagram and Twitter and all this, and when you had to mail in submissions to agencies. <laughs> so, um, so there's been ebbs and flows in my modeling career. It's been dead sometimes. And then there's times like when I was in LA, you know, between 2013 and 15, I mean, I was doing photo shoots. I probably had six or seven photo shoots a week sometimes on, for months on end. And, um, and what that did was it got, it got to me, it got to my head. And what I did was I quit my day job. Um, cause I figured I didn't need it. I was like, well, things are going well. You know, I just figured it was fine. Um, but it then just stopped. <laughs> so it stopped. And then I was out of a job that I just quit. And, um, at the same time I had decided, uh, um, my boyfriend and I had moved in together. We were living together for a couple years. And then I said, you know, I, it was just the relationship change, which is totally normal in relationships. And, um, I said, I, th I think I just want something different now. And so we broke up. And so I had made plans to move out, but I was still looking for a place to live. So it was a combination of all those things. So it was bad judgment, um, you know, legitimate life change choices. You know, if a relationship ends, it ends, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, so it was a combination of just life choices that were good and some that were bad. And it would just happened all like within the same month. And so when I said earlier, like it felt like the rug was pulled off from underneath me. That's exactly what it felt like. Cause that was, I was like, everything I had a minute ago is now gone, but really it's different, not gone, but it's different. Like you're saying the, I mean, I think there's a real danger to, and this is what happened to me is when that happened, I became numb. I, I didn't want to feel anymore. I was like, I can't like after my childhood and then after this, I was like, I don't want to deal with life anymore. You know, that's when the suicidal ideation started to come back. And I was, it was such a dark feeling and a bleak feeling and a hopeless feeling. But like you're saying, there's these people that love me still. And what happened was when I went back to Montana and I ended up living with my mother, one of the most difficult times in my life was doing that but it was the most it's the most beautiful thing that i've ever experienced and there's other miracles that happen at the same time like my sister was having a hard time the exact same time that i moved back and she was afraid to talk to any about what about was going on so she felt comfortable talking to me and i was able to guide her to some resources and that really helped her and so i mean life and I really do want to emphasize that, like exactly what you said, you know, there is, there was things that were good that I still had. I just couldn't see them in that despairing moment. And everything passes, as we know, like everything changes, good and bad. So nothing is forever. Good, good things end, bad things end. And, but when you're in that, you're in that state of hopelessness and despair, there's a real temptation. Like what I did was to stop feeling. And that set me back, I think. It set me back some time because I just became cold because I was so, I was so depressed. I was beyond depression, so despairing. And had it not been for my mother and my sister who needed my help, my mother, you know, when I was there for those two years, I helped her remodel her home. She's like, I'm not capable, physically capable of doing this work. And I would like to maybe sell the house, but it's, it's an estate, you know? And so I said, well, I'd be happy to, to do what I can, you know? So I was able to be of service again, bringing you back to the element of service. Um, my life was in tatters, but I was still able to do something to help someone else. And I did that twofold with my sister and my mother. And so in my darkest moment, my higher power, the universe still had a purpose for me and a huge purpose for me. Um, because my sister was entering a very dark place and I was able to, you know, to be of service to her and help her. And that, for me, again, I always go back to that. That's that critical point when, whenever I start getting that despairing feeling or the suicidal ideations where I feel like things are hopeless, 
then I'm, I have to look at what I'm not doing in service. Like, what can I be doing? Cause I have been blessed with many abilities and gifts in this life. I have so many abilities. Like, you know, I can dance. I've, I love to cook and I've, I can write and, you know, I work in data and, you know, I, all kinds of things that I am capable of doing um, that so many people don't have either the means or the ability, physical or otherwise. And so I am so blessed. And so if I am feeling that way, I need to look at what it is I'm not giving. What is it that I'm not doing in order to lift a community or some friends or what is it that I can give? Because I need to look at my toolbox, my inventory of my skill sets and look, like, look at what I have. Look at the cards I've been dealt because we are all dealt a different hand. And not compare my hand to someone else's hand. That's the, one of the biggest obstacles. And to look at my own hand and say, what have I been given in this lifetime? What can I make better? What can I learn more about? And then what can I do to help others? And it doesn't have to be huge. You know what I mean? I didn't cure cancer. I went back home to Montana and I helped my mother and my sister get through some things while at the same time, they gave me a place to live. And, and so that is like the crux for me. Like I have to always find that if I'm feeling that way, I got to find that way to be giving what I've been given. Uh, I love how you phrase that. A find a way to, to, to be giving what I've been given. Um, and what also stands out to me was the idea that you know, when you said uh, despairing feeling, uh, suicide ideations, you have to look for ways to be of service. Can you describe for me the despairing feeling? And, and I'm asking this because I, I can't remember anyone who I've had on a podcast that has really uh, highlighted that feeling of despair. They've, they've said, they've mentioned other things, heaviness, um, depression, mm -hmm. anxiety, heart racing. But can you talk to me what that feels like? Because I want the listeners who might be experiencing that to then be able to recognize it sooner. So then they know that the antidote or part of the solution is to be of service. How does that show up in your body, that feeling of despair? Yeah. So it's such a good question. And yes, thank you for asking that. That's so. Is my understanding, um, you know, mental, mental illness has so many shades and variations and spectrums. And, and just as you said, like, you know, people who have suicidal ideation can experience anxiety and depression, um, worry, angst, fear. And I certainly do experience those things um, from time to time, of course. Um, but for me, that despair comes. Uh, there's two ways, there's two common ways in which I have experienced it. One is when I compare and despair. So when I'm comparing where I'm at in my life right now to two things, where I think I need to be, like where I should, like I should be doing this instead, or I need to have this amount in my bank account, or I need to have this, this is the deadline. Today was the day that that was supposed to happen. <laughs> when I start that, I start despairing. I start going, oh God, something's wrong. Something is not right. I have to fix this. I got to do something. I so then it starts like this, uh, you know, it's cyclical. It starts this cycle of obsessive thinking of what's wrong, like what's wrong with me right this second. And it's a it's a voice. It just trickles in, and I can be happy as a clam, and then suddenly this thing will come in and want to ruin the party. Like this voice will come in and be like, hey, I'm here to bust up this happiness because this is you're having too much fun. And I'll just start, you know, it can be, I, and there's all kinds of triggers, you know, I mean, there's already been a lot of studies done with social media and how it can trigger that effect. Essentially people start comparing and despairing when they're looking at Instagram and all that, you know, artificial reality stuff. And so, um, so that's one of the ways it can trickle in. And then the other way that despair for me can happen is when something catastrophic does actually happen. You know, that's, 
it isn't just my imagination or that voice necessarily saying like, oh, you're not, you know, you're not rich enough yet. You know, that's one way I can get into despair. But the deeper, darker way is when there's a catastrophic event that can happen that just like with my life change moment, when I moved back here, didn't see it coming. It blindsided me. And what that is, is like a culmination of one, my expectations. I expected things to be going nicely and smoothly and they suddenly were not. So that set me up for some failure um, and for some heartache. And so what happened in that moment um, when I realized like I have to go back home, quote unquote home, a place that I had not called home in many years and I didn't want to call home in many, I'd never wanted to call home again. It was too painful. I did not want to go back. That's despair. Um, Having to face something that is so riddled with demons and darkness having to face it is a, will put you to, could put you in a place of despair it certainly put me in a place of despair um as i mentioned it turned out to be a blessing in disguise for many reasons i don't know if this book would ever have been written if that had happened because i was in such a space of despair that i was like i have to do something I have to create something. I have to do something with this darkness. Otherwise, it's I'm going to kill myself. It's going to kill me. It's going to convince me to kill myself. And so that so the feelings behind despair, like I can shade them with like dullness. Dull is an adjective that comes to mind. Like I couldn't cry. I I didn't want to laugh anymore. Um, I didn't want to hug. I didn't want. I didn't want to feel because feeling was so painful. Um, And part of that was too, in that despair is not letting go. I think that's what makes despair worse sometimes is not wanting to let go. And I, I fought the reality of moving back here. I fought it. I said, I, I cannot accept being here. I cannot accept what has happened. Like no way. Like, absolutely not. Like, I was rubbing shoulders with Leonardo DiCaprio and so-and-so and and all these names at these parties all the time. And I'm here in this place that I never wanted to come back to. (laughs) And that's despair because I wasn't, I was not in acceptance of what had happened. And so for me, despair, it can, there's so many layers of it and depths of despair, as they say. There's and there really is depths of despair because there's the compare and despair. And then there's life-altering catastrophic events where I'm not ready to accept what's happening, despair. And the bleakness and the numbness that comes with that. Um, and it's it had to be a protective thing. I mean, it had to be an emotional it had it had to have been a way for me to cope with what was actually happening because I was so not ready to accept it that I just turned off. I just turned off my feelings because I was like, I cannot process what is happening to my life. Um, And so that acceptance took a long time to settle into before I really was like, this is okay. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to do something anyway. I'm going to, I'm going to write this book. I'm going to, I'm going to help my mom remodel her house. Um, because I, what choice did I, it was either that or kill myself. And I knew enough at that point that service had always made me feel good before. So I was like, okay, I I need to get busy. I need to get busy doing something to get outside of my despair. You know, I can't really think my way out of it. I have to act my way out of it in a way. And um, that's what I mean when I first started a conversation. Like, I have to be busy. I have to be doing stuff because I can't sit and think my way out of my despair and, and depression or I have to do something. I have to get up out of my chair and do something physical. You know, that, that could be just call someone in that moment. If I'm in the despairing moment at that moment, I can call someone. Absolutely. Um, but it also means that I need a plan. I need a plan of action 
A, B, and C so that I can have something to look forward to, something to create, something to give. Um, but yeah, that's that's what despair is like for me and the way I've experienced it. Do you find it difficult to call someone when you're in a place of despair? I, I find it so hard for myself. I, I've, I'm becoming better at that practice. But that phone sometimes can feel like it's, it weighs a thousand pounds. And my fear mm-hmm. is that I'm, I'm burdening someone with my, with my sorrows and my, and my suffering. Uh, is that thought played through, through your mind? Or, and, and if so, how do you push through that and make the call anyway? Um, y- yes, definitely. It has happened. I definitely have sat with my demons instead of trying to shine light on them. Cause that's what it does. Like when I can talk to someone about it, it's the beginning of shining light on that little bit of, you know, that darkness that's taken residence. Um, and for me, if I get in a state like that, sometimes what I can attribute it to is almost being like strangled. So it's as if something dark has its hands around my throat and the further I go sitting with it alone, the tighter the grip gets and the harder it is for me to breathe, to speak, to do anything. And so as soon as I can recognize that feeling, the sooner I do make a call or get up and do something different, the better off I am, the better chances I have of not feeling worse and getting worse in the situation. So awareness is key. Recognition, like, oh, I'm feeling this old, I'm feeling the old feelings. I'm feeling this way. I know that's the thing is, is the, the biggest obstacle was realizing, I think for me anyway, is realizing when I start thinking and feeling that way, labeling it and saying, I'm putting a sticker on this. Like, I know what you are and I am not letting you take over. I had that happen um, even just a couple of weeks ago where I, ch- I changed jobs. And I had no reason to feel as scared as I was feeling, but it was escalating and that that throat tightening was happening. And I called a friend and I said, this is happening. And he said, your experience is not, it is not proportionate to what's happening. And I was like, you're right. It's not, I've completely blown it up out of proportion. And, (laughs) and, you know, by the end of a conversation, I felt better, but I remember thinking in the conversation, you know what? I am not, I am not going to feel this way. Not right now. Anyway, not tonight because there's no reason for it. Even if there was a reason for it, I don't want to feel this way. I don't want to feel that way. And so the earliest I can start pinpointing and identifying and labeling that voice or that feeling and saying, no, I'm not letting you in. Once it starts, it just gets stronger. And so the sooner that I can get to calling someone, the better. Um, I will say too, other things that have helped me is humor. When I pick up that phone and I tell the person, "Uh oh, girl, it's happening again. I've gone crazy. I just start making fun of myself a little bit it helps it helps me to be able to pick up that phone and and know like okay they're gonna laugh at what i'm gonna say so that that helps them maybe not feel me feel like they're not because they don't they never have cared they have been more than happy to help that 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 fear of being a burden is a story i'm telling myself and i'm believing it and so and if i can bring some humor when i call them like i have one really close friend who i call with all my problems and I call her up and I say, well, you know what's happening? It's just like, she should just start laughing, you know, because she already knows. <laughs> you know, so if I can bring some humor in myself a little bit, um, not in an unhealthy way, if it helps me to get that phone picked up, perfect. I love that. And, and so it sounds like in terms of what's helped you find strength and courage and hope, one is humor. Two is is giving what you've been given. Three mm-hmm. is uh, you know movement, action, whether that's gardening, whether that's uh, theater, acting, um, you know, even construction, helping your mom around the house. Um, are there is there anything else that has helped you find strength? Have you been to therapy at all? Have you tried prescription meds? 
meditation, journaling? Mm -hmm. Are you, have you read anything? All the above. Yeah. <laughs> and so in, in terms of, uh, let's pick each one apart in terms of therapy, what are some practical or uh, applicable things that we could share with the listeners that your, that your therapist has had you do or shared with you, whether it's a reframing of your thoughts or whether it's something she actually had you do? Yeah, a lot of reframing, a lot of reframing. I mean, when you grow up with um, active addiction, the way your brain operates is different if you don't. It just is. Your entire cellular, molecular being is different. The way you observe, process, see, think, it, it's entirely different. Neurologically, everything is different when you grow up. So therapy, all those things you listed are all important as far as having a big toolbox and utilizing all the tools at your disposal and getting new ones when the other ones don't work. So yeah, therapy definitely it's a, essentially, you know, reprogramming of the way I process or think about things. Definitely. Um, journaling is a big part of like a therapy process. Jared, not to cut you off, but with the, with the therapy reframing, can you give us an example of something she had you reframe? My therapist right now is always trying to get me to get, stop saying always one, um, mm -hmm. never like the black and white thinking, the mm -hmm. catastrophizing, uh, the overgeneralizations. Is there, are, are there, there have been any specific thoughts she's had you reframe? Well, that compare and despair would be like an example of that. Like, you know, when you're in that space, that's what, you know, she said, so be aware of that. And I think that labeling is another tool, um, that she would have me do. And she still has me does if I need to, but labeling. And then, Gratitude writing, like writing grateful th things I'm grateful for every day. Um, in my own practice, I also write a letter to um, my higher power every morning, um, just as a way to connect. Um, so those are tools that have been prescribed to me. That letter to your higher power, what uh, is it like a, a few sentences? Is it three pages? Is it freestyling? Is it is there a blueprint? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's mostly a, a a blueprint, and it's um, it's a it's a it's maybe like two paragraphs. It's nothing. It's it's never meant to be self punishing. So if ever it becomes a punitive exercise, like I have to do this, it's gonna blah, 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 then I need to take a break from it you know, and let it kind of get fresh again. But yeah, it's, it's simply an acknowledgement. You know, what I do in that letter is I say, um, you know, uh, I say higher power. This is, this is what I envision you are. This is where I see you in my day or in my day to day. And, you know, and for me, it's an, ex I see higher power express itself mostly through nature. Um, you know, the extraordinary, outrageous incredible beauty that nature is i mean from the shapes of snowflakes to the varying different flowers which are why flowers are such an important part of the story because that's how one of the ways my higher power communicates and expresses himself to me um so i i list the ways in which i see my higher power through exquisite beauty or happenings like this morning i saw a sunrise and i've never seen a mauve lavender sunrise before it was purple in certain areas and i've never seen such a shade i've seen pinks and oranges and you know yellows and those very but i've never have seen that color before and i was like wow that's an expression of my higher power and so anyway i list a few things in which i i see my and those can be repetitive those are the ways in which i usually see my higher power you know um and then i go on to say you know i I am powerless today over people, places, and things. I, I can't control or change people. If they need changing, you need to do it. I can't do that. And then I say, you've blessed me, you know, with so many gifts and abilities, like I was saying earlier, talents and skills. Use them all up. Do not give these to me to just have me sit on them. What a, what a way to live in vain. You've given me so much 
use it all up. You know, that's my command to you, God. (laughs) And so then I go on to say, you know, if I've made, if I've done harm, please guide me to make amends where necessary. And then I go on to writing things I'm thankful for, you know, friends, family, warmth, abundance, because there's so much abundance in my life. Um, Anything really that I'm grateful for. And then I I pray for healing of certain things, um, friends, family, enemies. I pray for their their wellness, and I just write that down. And it's probably just a couple paragraphs, and you know it varies slightly every day, but the format is essentially the same. And I have taken breaks from it where I would be like, oh, this is just getting either it's too repetitive. I'm not connecting. Essentially, I'm just doing it because I'm just doing it. So then I'm like, this isn't this isn't me connecting. And so I stop and then I'll, you know, I'll, I'll pick it up when I feel like I need to again. But so that's definitely a tool. It's been a beautiful ritual in my life. And um, which is, I mean, writing for me is perfect because I've always written in some form. I've written poems when I was younger. I've always written as a sense of therapy to answer that question. Um, yeah. Well, wow, that's such a powerful share. And, and, and I really want to highlight that you said that, you know, your routine should never feel punitive. If mm-hmm. you start noticing the thoughts of, I have to do this, uh, then maybe you need to take a break. And I want to highlight that part also, that idea of I need to take a break, because I know, at least for me, and a lot of us, um, you know, have that black and white thinking, we go, well, if it's punitive, or I don't feel like doing it, then I should just stop doing it completely. Right. And, and sometimes mm-hmm. we were like that in relationships where it's like, mm-hmm. uh, we're having a bad day, so we should just end this relationship. Or I should just quit mm-hmm. my job. Like, you quit your job. You're like, <laughs> things are going great. And so we think <laughs> it's always going to go great. So I don't need my day job. And mm-hmm. it's like, no, maybe you could take a break, but don't, you know, take take three days off from work, but don't don't quit your job. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. to to allow ourselves permission to take a break from things, to go on sabbatical, to step back for a little while, to mm-hmm. not feel like we have to, you don't have to, like, you know, I talk about journal, exercise, reading, meditate, self-talk. You don't have to do it every day. If you miss a day or take a few days off, that's fine because then you learn to appreciate it when you come back to it. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's such a powerful share. Um, in terms of reading, is there anything that you've read, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, that's helped you along your journey? Yeah, um, God, I have read. I have read so many books on the, the, theology, religion, spirituality. I have read the gamut um, in search for, you know, in search for help, answers, uh, clarity, and so each one has had its virtues, its strengths. Um, for me, uh, non-denomination spirituality books work better, um, in my experience anyway, uh, books where higher power is not defined for me work better for me when I get to define my own sense of higher power that works better for me because then i can actually establish a stronger connection i always say that when someone tries to force their religion on me or if they try to give me their version of what god is or higher power is it's like wearing someone else's shoes or their pants it they it just doesn't feel right i can't connect to it and when i get to create my own version of what a higher power is that is the most intimate bond and that's what's important. That's the most important part of having that connection. How does one have a relationship without a bond? Because that's what, you know, having a relationship with a higher power is critical. Um, and, and so how does it happen without having some sort of connection? And for me, that connection doesn't exist unless I get to be a part of its create, you know, what it is, at least believing what it, I think it is. So those kind of books tend to resonate more with me. Um, and I, I, it's funny, I don't read a lot of fiction. <laughs> I, I'm a fiction writer, but I don't read a lot of fiction. Um, and what I actually, I do love to read is some philosophical things, like some French sociology and some French philosophy. And also I love Russian literature, uh, like Tolstoy. 
um, the, the sense of place that he gives in that in that Russian, it's so uh, it's so immersive. I'm just I'm steeped in the culture, and I feel like I'm there when I'm reading it. So I enjoy those. But. I I just finished uh, Anna Karenina. Oh, and good for you! I read uh, mm. and right before that, I read Crime and Punishment. I'm definitely more of a Tolstoy fan. Dostoevsky, mm-hmm. uh, when you describe immersive, that's I, I think of Dostoevsky as immersive, and I think of Tolstoy as character. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, they're both immersive. But mm-hmm. if I'm comparing the two, I, I'm more fascinated by the characters in Tolstoy. Sure. And then, oh, yeah. um, and then when I'm reading Dostoevsky, I'm just like I almost feel like I can taste wherever he's. I can taste, smell, feel. It's so tactile the way mm-hmm. he describes uh, a place. So yeah, yeah it, absolutely. Yeah, and in those in in, in less Russian literature, religion is so a huge part of culture of Russian society and culture. And what I also like to do in those in those when I read those is compare how religion is either dominating or directing culture today compared to what it was then. And of course, take from it anything that I like and leave what I don't like. Um, But I am always fascinated by the human, the human's condition and its relationship with what they call God now um, over time and how that's kind of evolved and what that looks like. I've always found that just interesting as a spiritual aspect of it. Yeah, absolutely. What's your favorite Russian book that you've read so far? Anna Karenina. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, you know, I've read, well, I haven't fully read War and Peace. I don't know. I think there's an actual saying that no one actually reads War and Peace because there's no plot. It's more of a historical recount. And Tolstoy is an amazing historian, an incredible historian first. And he wrote Anna Karenina after War and Peace. And Anna Karenina is actual story. Like he has a plot. There's a, you know character arches and stuff. Um, but in War and Peace, there's it's just like a recount of what's happening at the time in Russia, which is really neat. But it's so it's so much drier, if that makes sense. Um, so I love it. But definitely Anna Karenina. There's the prose in Anna Karenina, like you said, the characters. I remember I watched the the movie Anna Karenina when it came out. I love Chris uh, Keir Knightley. And I remember her like whizzing into the screen in the first scene. And I was like, what? Anna Karina doesn't show up until like 14 chapters in the book. <laughs> she can't be there now. <laughs> so I didn't finish watching it, but I enjoyed uh, uh, it. Same thing. As soon as I, I tried to watch it and after five minutes, I was like, nope. <laughs> I can't do it. It's not like the book at all. Yeah. <laughs> What uh, and for a lot of people out there, sleep insomnia is a, is a big thing that they struggle with, and I and I know that uh, at nighttime, that's you know the the comparing and despairing, the suicide ideations, the pain. Do you have any? Do you have a sleep protocol or anything that you do or don't do to uh, have an effective sleep? Yeah, that's changed over time. Um, I definitely have struggled with insomnia, and I. I still get bouts of it. The only difference today is I don't care so much. The only difference today is I'm not, before I would, I, it's that self-punishing thing. Like, is it punitive? I would just beat myself up. Like I'm, oh, I'm not going to be productive tomorrow. I'm not going to feel good. I'm not going to, you know, on and on. I would obsess about it. And now if I just can't sleep, I'm like, well, I'm going to go, I don't know, I'll watch something. I'll, I'll get up and, you know, eventually I will sleep usually if that's the case. But the the less I worry about it, the more chances I have of sleeping. And the think the overall point is I'm just trying to learn and I am learning to become less punishing of myself and less brutal with myself because that's what's happening. And the times when I have insomnia, you know, I'm obsessing about something. I'm trying to figure out some solution to something that can't be figured out yet. I'm trying to find some way to, to, to make something happen or I'm trying to, and it's just, or I'm beating myself up about something. So, so when I feel that way, I'm like, okay, whatever. I take a nap tomorrow, whatever. Well, I'll take a day off if I need to. It's so much. It's so much more beautiful living life when you can accept who you are, and that's part of it. Accepting who you are frees you up from so much 
chatter in your head that you'll have much better sleep. At least that's what been my experience. Like I said, I still get bouts of insomnia, but when I do, I don't, I don't beat myself up about it anymore. I don't worry about it. I'm like, oh, I'll sleep eventually. It's not a big deal. Like big deal. Or what if I'm up for a couple more hours? I mean, even last night I, I got up um, because the second book is actually, it's under contract negotiations right now. It's, I don't have a publication date yet, but hopefully this year it comes out. Um, but yeah, I started obsessing about the contract, you know, 2 a.m. Like it's like anything's going to get figured out at 2 a.m. <laughs> without a contract. So I, I was like, oh, okay, well, I just turn on the TV, put on some great British breaking, baking show. Cause that's like, you know, um, Xanax or Prozac for, <laughs> for reality TV is the way that goes. Yeah. For me it's HGTV. And then TV. Yeah. Mm-hmm, yeah, exactly. You got something that's mellow, um, not high drama. Um, and then, you know, I just fell back asleep, but I mean, there's always something like no matter when life, even when life gets really good and exciting, you know what I mean? Like being a published author is fantastic, but contract negotiating, like all this stuff comes with it that, you know, it makes it challenging and sometimes unpleasant. And so I've realized as I've gotten older and I've dealt with my own mental issues like this, you know, the patterns over and over again, obsessing and insomnia. Am I gonna, do I really want to live my life like that? I mean, everyone would say, no, I can't imagine someone who would say, yes, I do. I enjoy that. You know, everyone would say, yeah, I would, I would not like to live like that. You know, give yourself permission. Absolutely. I think I'm my, I'm always my biggest obstacle, my biggest hurdle. Um, I just need to get out of my way as my, my good friend would say, who's really close to me, get out of the way, Jared. <laughs> um, because I always make problems bigger than they are in my head, you know? So um, I guess the other thing I would add to that for the insomnia thing, I've noticed over times and periods of my life, I sleep better again when I am doing something that fulfills me. I sleep better. So when I'm in theater doing plays and nights, you know, it's not that I'm just physically exhausted. My spirit is exhausted because it's had so much fun. When I'm, writing and finishing a book up or whatever i'm writing a section and i get done with the section my spirit is tired and it feels good and it's saying yay thank you and when i'm in that space i know i'm in the flow of what my higher power wants for me because there's no resistance there's no pain there's no ifs and buts what ifs it's just light and as i get older my really my goal is to find more of that and to find ways to connect to that more. And when I'm not, not to worry about it because it will come again. It always does come again. Um, And even if you're not an artistic person, which is totally okay, you can still find service. You can still find what I, I had left a job that I actually loved once and I'll never forget it because I've quit many a jobs that I didn't like and felt great quitting them. But I actually left a job that I loved and that despair that I felt that came over me. And what that was, was I had a sense of purpose. I was contributing something. People appreciated me. I was full and it was gone. And I had insomnia after that, for sure. I had a lot of despair after that. Um, so if that doesn't tell you something, at least it told me about how important that is, at least in my existence, that I know that I'm contributing and helping and, and being a service it doesn't have to be artistic. It can be anything. It can be anything that's outside of myself, bigger than myself. That is such a gift to know what that is. And it can change. You can have more than one. You can have big ones, small ones, all kinds of acts of service, you know, lifelong ones, you know, short-lived ones. Like you're saying, don't be black and white about it. Um, let it evolve. Jared, is there anything apart about your journey that we haven't discussed that you feel like is important for the listeners uh, before we wrap up? Nothing that springs to mind. I mean, I, I mean, I've so enjoyed this conversation, and I really appreciate you um, having me on your show. It's just, it's just, it's just wonderful. And this book, you know, my books, it's so for me, it's so special because it's not just a fun adventure. It's so much more. It's so much more out there in these books 
to help people. I think too, especially if they really read what's happening, you know, look, look between the lines kind of thing. I love it. Uh, get the book good Oliver Dooley and the palace of keepers book one. So you might as well get the, you got to get it because there's going to be another one. You don't want to be behind on this and, <laughs> and hear why everybody else is rating it five stars. So yeah, I'm, I'm putting a little, uh, uh, a fear of missing out on you, uh, listeners out there. And it's, I know it's available on uh, Amazon, uh, Jared Bowl at G E R R A D B O H L. Check it out. There'll be a link in the show notes for it also. Uh, last two questions. What are you looking forward to, Jared? I'm looking forward to, um, I've got, I have a lot happening right now that I'm very much looking forward to. A big change in life brought me here. And after slow, steady progress, I may be moving to upstate New York to be buying a place now. So from going homeless to buying my first property, amazing, amazing. It's going to bring challenges. It's going to bring challenges, but there's always hope. Um, so I'm looking forward to that very much so. All right. I, I, I'm excited. To, I'm excited to hear that. We'll oh, have you back on too to to, to check on your progress and and see where you're at. And uh, you know, we we didn't get to talking uh, to about your father at all and, and those relationships. Mm -hmm. But I'm excited to see what the next chapter of your life is, and uh, and also to hear about the next book, book two, uh, that I'm sure will be released soon. Uh, last That's... question I like to ask of all my guests is always: Imagine there's one person listening in who may be on the precipice of wanting to end their life before you kill yourself, what would you say to them, Jared? Um, of course there's a suicide hotline, call it. Um, but also I think ask yourself what it is that you can give because there has to be something you wouldn't be here otherwise. There it is, ladies and gentlemen. What is it that you can give? What What is left? Take inventory and share it. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Before You Kill Yourself. Remember, this podcast is not a substitute for you going to get help, for you calling the 1-800-SUICIDE or any of the other international phone numbers that are listed in each and every one of the show notes because I know I got listeners out there in America, the UK, India, Canada, Japan, Australia. I really appreciate you. And then, you know, my, my, my stateside people in Chicago, Portland, Denver, LA, Charlotte, DC, Texas. I appreciate you all. And I know I have listeners in other parts of the world, uh, but I just want to specifically shout those people out and, 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 and wherever you're listening from, from the, from the world or even in space, everybody's doing space travel. Now I feel like I'm the only one that hasn't seen Mars. Um, but uh, wherever you are, there are phone numbers. You can call, you can chat, you can text, and uh, you can pick up that book, Good Oliver Dooley and the Palace of Keepers, book one on Amazon. Scoop it up. Uh, you can always go to thrivewithleo.com for one-on-one -on -one coaching with yours truly. Let's get to tomorrow together. Thank you so much, Jared. Thank you.